Um, since the topic is rock and roll law, lore, I thought you might ask Gary about the legend of John Lennon's stolen guitar. <laughs> now, he, she sets the, the table this way. August 1964, uh, the British invasion hits Cincinnati, Ohio. The Cincinnati Gardens, aside from some other little hitches in the scheduling, the Beatles discover that someone has broken in backstage and stolen some of their personal items, among which was John Lennon's beloved Rickenbacker, a Capri 325 model. Does that sound about right? Well, you know, this is a great urban legend. And, uh, you know, I've, it, it's fascinating to hear about it because, uh, you know, you know uh, that a lot of these things start, and they seem like they have the basics and truth. But the thing that I've been able to find about the missing Capri 1958 325 Rickenbacker was in, it was never turned in as stolen. Well, this is what she goes on to say, mm -hmm. so don't hang on here. Sure. So oddly enough, she said the theft was never publicized, so maybe it never really happened, question mark. Otherwise, it would seem that every cop and Beatle fan would be scouring the city for that Rickenbacker, right? Or perhaps the Beatles thought it would be best to keep it quiet, awaiting contact from the culprits and a chance at retrieving the guitar. But either way... Whether the story is true or not, we know that no such contact came. Well, back in the early 80s, I was shown a guitar, she said, after having been repeatedly told a story. When I finally saw the thing, I remember thinking, that's it? Not nearly as fancy as I pictured it. Of course, a lot of my opinion was based upon its neutral coloring and the fact that there were now, n there were now spaces where the pickups should have been. It had been stripped down. It was oddly shaped to my thinking, just not much to look at. But Ian, the story had me. She said, I'd heard it from more than a few folks who had always told it the same way. Three of those folks are gone now from my life, maybe only two still remaining. Who knows for sure? Uh, but they're getting old and so am I. So as I write this, uh, she says, I sit below an attic where an ugly, stripped Rickenbacker had laid, gathering dust for almost 40 years. And I wonder, when subsequent pictures of the alleged, uh, allegedly stolen Capri are cited as proof otherwise, did Lennon miss his old one so much that he just hurriedly went out and had another one made? Food food for thought. A, a meal for Gary Patterson. All right, where are you with that? Well, I think it's a fascinating story. I know that the Rickenbacker guitar she's talking about was made in 1958. It was originally a honey brown color. Right. That when the Beatles had their picture made by Astrid when they were in Hamburg, uh, Lennon's holding it. I also know that he had the guitar refinished in black and it was the guitar he played on the Ed Sullivan Show in 1964. And I've heard that the guitar was refinished in black so it would match uh, George Harrison's guitar. But there's not been any evidence that the guitar was stolen. And, and matter of fact, there was some modifications done. Uh, I know that the tone and volume controls were taken off. I also know that uh, there were a few little repairs done. Maybe the middle pickup, according to the legend, was disconnected because Lennon's pick continuously kept hitting it. And uh, I also know that the guitar, from what I understand, was at the Dakota with Yoko. And I think, and I'm pretty sure of this, that the guitar was played. It was John's beloved Rickenbacker, and I believe it was played on uh, his last album. So I'm, I'm, I think that the guitar is on display now in Japan at one of the museums that handles the greatest collection of John Lennon memorabilia. But I can tell you, Ian, if you want to check and make sure uh, if the guitar, if you look at the input jack where the cable goes in, if you notice if it has two letters, like above the jack, if it has a letter like G and B, then it can't be that guitar because Rickenbacker numbered their guitars with the first letter, and this was in 61. So it would start with a letter like uh, A would be the year 1961, and another A would be the month January. I know I used to own a 67 Rickenbacker 12-string 360, and the initial was GB, which would be 1967 in February. But the original 58, if I remember, and this sort of put me on the spot, but I believe it started with a number 3 for like 325, and then the next initial would either be a C, which meant combo guitar, or a V, and V means it had a vibrato. And then if it was C or 3C, the next number, the, say an 8, would be 1958. So if you want to see if you've got a guitar from the same year, it should be 3C8 or 3V8. And that would be one way to check if it was a 58. Now, I think that's correct. I know that. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah. So, I mean, 
just off the top of my head, that's how you could tell if the guitar was actually from that year 58 and if it, if it was really something to it. But I've not heard anything. I mean, I've, as you know, I do a lot of stuff on the Beatles. But right. I do know that John Lennon had a guitar stolen, but it was his beloved J160E, the acoustic electric guitar he played. That guitar was stolen, and that was in 63, I believe. So that guitar being stolen may have crossed over into the myth into the black 325. And I think the only other damage I know a Beatle having is I think George Harrison's Gretsch fell off a, tr- uh, a car and was crushed in Scotland. Oh, no. And I think McCartney sold one of his Hofner basses. So now, to the best of my knowledge, that's what I would think. So You know, did they, were they ever to recover that other guitar stolen from Lennon? No, no. Okay. Uh, that guitar has never been recovered. And, uh, you know, Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top was given a Stratocaster by Jimi Hendrix, and that guitar was stolen. Ugh. But eventually... Gibbons got the guitar back, so some nice person returned it to him. Well, that's amazing and pretty yeah. rare. Uh, I'd like to do, when we go to phones later on, I'd love to do a little rock and roll lost and found. I'm just curious whether <laughs> what people have or what they think they have, you know, and things or things like this, like in this in this case of this Rick from, uh, from 1964, that this person was told over and over again was the mm-hmm. stolen John Lennon guitar. And I'll... And I don't know if it's the same one, but coincidentally, I had another email about that stolen Rickenbacker this week. When somebody saw that you were coming on, they sent an email, and it was very cryptically worded, uh, and it just said that they would be interested in hearing your response to the question of whatever happened to that stolen Rickenbacker because they said, I had a friend who always swore that they had it, and I would saw it many times. And they were kind of leaving it floating out there almost as though they were afraid of incriminating somebody that they knew for still having it. And then I got this one from from Joe. And so I, I don't know quite what to do. That. I wonder if there's just lots of people who claim to have John Lennon stolen Reckenbacher. And that's and that's just become a great story. Well, it's a great story, but it seems like there's a lot of interest. And I bet a lot of Coast listeners are obviously maybe chatting about it, which right. means there are a lot of great Beatle fans. So, Ian, maybe we had a chance to sort of set it right or add some more information to it, but it's a fascinating story. I think one of the strangest things I can remember, Ian, that was stolen was uh, there's a legend that when Jimi Hendrix died, that uh, this is one of the conspiracy theories, that every apartment that he owned – that was in either in England or New York, that they were broken into before his death was announced, and things were stolen. And one of the things that was stolen was supposedly the last great master tape that Hendrix had done. I think the album was called Black Gold or whatever. And uh, and this album was taken, and no one knows what happened to it. So this is a, a complete master that's part of the urban legend of something being taken from Hendrix. I know that when Brian Jones died, uh, a lot of his material was taken out of the house and, and stolen. And when we're talking about Al Cooper, you know, Al Cooper also owned a Jimi Hendrix Stratocaster, and he was so terrified leaving the guitar in his house because those guitars are extremely valuable because what they have to do is they have to trace the serial number from Manny's in New York to to say that Hendrix actually owned it. So he just eventually sold it to a Japanese collector, and I think it's known as the Jimi Hendrix Al Cooper Stratocaster now. But, I mean, some of the stuff is so valuable that, you know, you have to be very careful who you keep. Right. And that turned to a conversation about backmasking. Somebody, had, one of my kids had been told by one of their friends about how, uh, you know, the, the, just the different messages and songs. And, and I got to thinking about that whole backmasking thing and, and how it's gone sort of. We can't, since everything's out on compact disc, <laughs> right? There, you can't do backmasking. You can't play a record backward. And that, that kind of ended the whole era of people looking for hidden messages and songs by playing the albums backwards, didn't it? Well, you know, it was a lot of fun sitting in a dark room with your turntable, spinning those records backwards and listening to the backward messages. But actually, Ian, you can uh, put your CD in your computer and save it as a WAV file and reverse it. It's actually easier to do now than it was with an album, and you don't even ruin your needle. So it's... And- yeah, because it was really fun to play records backwards when it was somebody else's turntable. Exactly, not I'd yours. like to think. Mm-hmm. Uh, but so, are there still back mask messages in albums? Does that still happen? I, 
I, you don't hear about it as much. I mean, I remember, I think it was Motley Crue's first album uh, when it came out. There was a, I remember there's a disclaimer on the lyric sheet that says, uh, warning, we are not responsible for any subliminal messages, which means go out and buy the album, play it backwards and have fun, you know, right. go out and get it. But I haven't heard of anything. I mean, I've heard that there were some, some tracks on, on, let's see, I think it's Beck, I'm a loser, baby, why don't you kill me? When you play it backwards, it says the same thing. Uh, so there are people still looking for it. But, you know, you know how I feel, and I feel like a lot of this is just like if you throw paint on the wall. Right. And uh, you throw paint on the wall, that's what you see. And somebody else walks in, and they see all these uh, hidden things. And maybe it should tell you about who sees the hidden things and not what's actually there. Sure, Rorschach of some sort. But yeah. which ones were the, what do you think the most famous back mask stories were? Because, I mean, especially with the Beatles and, mm-hmm. or with John Lennon, because mm-hmm. uh, I remember on the Double Fantasy album, you know, or there's that whole thing about when Yoko supposedly says just before one of the songs, I can't remember which one, Kiss, 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 or something, well, before one of the songs, it sounds like when you play it backwards, Yoko is saying, I shot John. <laughs> it, have you ever heard that? I have heard it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, which ones stick out in your memory as, okay. as the best backmasked songs or supposedly backmasked songs? All right. Why don't we do the ones that are actually are? Okay. okay. And 100% they are. And well, let's start with Rain by the Beatles because Rain had the very first backward vocal track. Right. And it's on the last verse. And uh, it sounds like he's chanting. But when you play the record backwards, all you hear John Lennon say is, when the rain comes, they run and hide their heads. So they took the verse, they reversed it because they liked the way it sounded. I think at that time, the Beatles liked a lot of things backwards, like sure. backward guitar loops, <laughs> backward snare, backward right. hi-hat. But that's actually there. And then I guess my personal favorite is from ELO. And uh, I believe it's right before Fire on High. And you hear, or when the album starts, and you hear this uh, really strange voice that almost sounds like satanic voice, and it sounds spooky. But when you play it back, you hear Jack, uh, Jeff Lynn say, uh, the music is reversible, but time is not. Ah. Turn back, turn back. He does it like four times, and they ask him, they said, what are you saying, turn back? And he said, well, if you're playing your record backwards, if you don't turn it back, you're going to lose your needle. It's going to fall off the album <laughs> <laughs> you have to turn back. And then I like the one about the B-52s off the uh, detour through your mind where uh, you hear them say, I buried my parakeet in the backyard. No, no, you're playing your record backwards. Watch out. You may ruin your needle. That's a backward track. <laughs> and that's fun. And then there's also one on the Prince album, uh, Purple Rain, right before Darling Nikki. And, you know, <laughs> it's always the story goes that there are always dark, evil messages. And when you play the Prince one backwards, you hear him say, hello, how are you? I'm fine because I know the Lord is coming soon, coming, coming soon. So I guess that sort of throws that out, the idea that it's always dark and sinister messages. And I guess another good one is off uh, Pink Floyd, The Wall, right before Empty Spaces, I think, is on the song. And you hear it very quietly. You can listen to Roger Waters say, congratulations, you just discovered the secret message. Please send your answer in care of old Pink, the funny farm, Chafford. And then you hear an engineer say, Roger, Carolyn's on the phone, and Carolyn's his wife. So, yeah, those are in there. But the ones that most people get into are what we call the phonetic reversal, uh, like the instant stairway to heaven on Halloween, I guess, where uh, you would have to say a phrase like, uh, I've just discovered the secret message. You say it, play that backwards, and get the phonetic structure, and you create some form of gobbledygook lyric that when it is reversed, it's going to say what you want it to say. Well, I want you to give some examples for that. Even though they may not be true, they create probably the best-known rock and roll controversies of my era as people went ruining tone arm after (laughs) turntable looking for them. Led Zeppelin being the best example because so many of those tracks were uh, supposedly passing along subliminal satanic messages trying to, you know, churn out Satan's army for a new millennium. So we'll come back to this and we'll pick up the ones that are supposedly there in those songs with the guy that should know, Gary Patterson, next on Coast Coast to Coast Live, this is Ian Punnett. You were just getting to the part about backmasking tracks, which are maybe not what the writers intended, but maybe were. Let's give some, let's roll over some of those. Let's do some of the funny ones, like uh, on Queen, another one bites the dust. Right. 
supposedly you play it backwards, you hear a voice that says, decide to smoke marijuana. And, you know, mm, when you listen to it, and, and I guess if you really want to be objective about it, and what we should tell the listeners is that they should play the song forward and then reverse it, and without reading what it's supposed to say, see what they hear. Because, see what jumps out at yeah, you. Yeah, because a lot of this is really, you know, if it's guided listening. Once you sure. hear it, it's a lot easier to hear it, but that's one. And then, of course, let's see, Hotel California uh, with the Eagles. Uh, there's, a, there's a part where it's reversed where it sounds like you can hear – Oh, Satan, how he started his own religion. Well, you know that he should. How nice. And, uh, of course, Don Henley vehemently uh, disagrees that it's in there. And then the urban legend started that the reason this passage was in Hotel California was that the Hotel California was a song about the Church of Satan. It ties in the Marilyn Monroe, uh, not Marilyn Monroe, but James Mansfield's death because she left and she was killed by a curse and that the hotel is the location of a brothel in San Francisco that was located on California Avenue, therefore Hotel California. And if you looked at the inside of the album cover, you saw the eagle standing at a at a reception desk, and in the balcony you see this man glowering down in black right. with a goatee and a shaved head and was supposed to be Anton LaVey, the, the right. founder of the Church of Satan. But the eagles say, well, actually, this guy was a, an extra who was going to be in the film. He went to sleep upstairs, and when he heard us yell, you know, for the for the shoot, he just looked over the railing, and that's his picture. Mm. So a lot of things, maybe things aren't exactly what they seem to be. And then, of course, we've got the famous, most famous of all, Stairway to Heaven. Uh, by the way, I've been to the Hotel California. The, all right. The one that they used for that shot, or the one that supposedly mm-hmm. was used to inspire the title. I, I can't remember, but it's uh, it's right there in... It's right there in California. It's right there in uh, Santa Monica, I believe. Oh, okay. uh, it's right along the beach. Um, so, uh, or at least that's what they claim. I was I was staying in the <laughs> hotel. Champagne on ice. I got it. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so then Led Zeppelin "Stairway to Heaven." Right now, uh, I think what made it believable for a lot of people was the idea that Jimmy Page was really obsessed with magic, the study of it. And, of course, he says, I do not worship the devil, but I am interested in magic. And he was interested in Aleister Crowley. And Crowley had a book called Theory of Practicing Magic, and there's a phrase in there where it says the sorcerer or the magician must learn to think backwards, to talk backwards, to listen to his phonograph records backwards. So a lot of people who got into this were trying to make it fit by saying, well, okay, there's a Crowley teaching that would say that's why Page may have done this. But Plant argues that, no, it was not intentional, neither does Page. But supposedly what you'd have to do is take the third verse of Stairway to Heaven with a phrase where the, uh, and there's a bustle in your head, you don't be alarmed now. Take that verse and reverse it, and supposedly it has this really interesting saying that says, uh, here's to my sweet Satan, and then the one will be the sad one who makes me sad, whose power is in Satan. And then, I mean, you can hear those pretty clearly. And then the third line is something like, uh, he will give you 666, follow him with worship, bring me yourself, my sad Satan. So that's supposed to be the whole verse. But, I mean, to be able to do that would be incredible to make it fit. Of course, some people say, well, maybe they didn't do it. It's just, you know, the bad vibes of this. Because when they recorded Led Zeppelin IV, they recorded it at Headley Grange, which was a Victorian workhouse. And when they walked into the the session, I mean, it had been closed and then it reopened as a studio and they, they, they wanted to record. They went upstairs and Paige said he saw spirits. He saw ghosts, that his bed was completely always wet and that there was some sort of supernatural force in the house. So, you know, that goes back to the urban legend, too. But uh, that's probably the most famous. And there's other phrases uh, in the song that can be reversed backwards, like, uh, and it makes me wonder, turns into, I will sing because I live with Satan. And if you know where it's supposed to say this, then you hear it, and it sounds like, okay, maybe it is. But uh, I did an experiment, and I did it with my class because we were doing subliminals, and, and I let them listen to it, and I asked them to write down what they heard. And not anyone in the class ever picked it up <laughs> and got it. You know, but after uh, I told them, they thought it was oh my gosh, and they oh, I could hear that word, right, and they word. suddenly had all goosebumps and everything. Uh, you know, I, I guess the last one I'll mention though, and it just always cracks me up, but I think I mentioned it to you once in a conversation we had years ago, uh, was the Mister Ed theme. Do you remember that? <laughs> oh, is that Satan is the source? Is yeah, that Satan one? is the source, <laughs> and 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 they, they, the, there was a, an evangelist that was actually claiming 
that that was really the intent of the author of the theme to Mr. Ed was and was it just seemed to be totally convinced that this was so this was in so many things that artists didn't even know that they were writing them. It was evidence of a kind of supernatural control by Satan over their creativity so that they thought they were writing a horse is a horse, of course, of course. But really, it was <laughs> Satan getting them to write messages backwards. But I've got a great one for you. Okay. Next time you hear that argument, ask them if they've heard Silver Bells by Bing Crosby. Uh, I've heard backwards. about this. What's it backwards? Which is uh, agents of evil. They are listening. They are longing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, I mean, you can't have it both ways. And then uh, you take the word evangelist sometimes and you change the letters. It becomes evil's agent. So, you know, you've got to be careful on how you look into everything. Now, don't you? Uh, coming up on the anniversary of Buddy Holly's death, uh, what, February 3rd. And this renews the whole discussion about the Buddy Holly curse. Uh, explain what that means for people. Well, it was really interesting for me because uh, when I started doing, well, I guess when I wrote Hellhounds on Their Trail originally, I talked a little bit about it. But then I really got into it and started digging up even more information, and I came up with a chapter. It's called The Buddy Holly Curse. I think it's the second chapter in the book. But, I mean, it was fascinating to me on how many people had tragic outcomes who were associated with Buddy Holly with either the date of his birth, the plane crash, or had known him personally, or had taken his place in the crickets. And, you know, we always know that 1959 was the year the music died. That's what Don McLean tells us in American Pie. But, you know, 1959 was almost the year rock and roll died, because if you remember, I believe Little Richard gave up rock and roll in 57. Elvis was in the Army. Chuck Berry had been arrested. Uh, Alan Freed had been uh, gone through the payola scandals. His career was ruined. And then Jerry Lee Lewis married his 13-year-old cousin, and he was out of the loop. So in 1959, everything almost ended. But, of course, with the plane crash on February 3rd, 1959, in which uh, Buddy Holly and uh, the Big Bopper and Richie Valens were killed, after their death, it seemed like things still eerie things started happening to anyone involved. And you mentioned Joe Meek earlier, so maybe we ought to bring him into the curse. And let me just tell you that Joe Meek was probably the greatest record producer in the U.K. This is before George Martin. And uh, he had a, a complex recording using compression that sort of compared him with Phil Spector, because they were the two, Spector in the United States, Meek in England. And anyway, Meek was into, well, he was into the occult. And one night they were reading tarot cards. And as they, uh, one person turned the card over, they were all holding hands, and, and then they would write the inscription or the meaning of the card. And as they were playing this, the card said, February 3rd, Buddy Holly dies. So Joe Meek is a major Buddy Holly fan. Had now, how does, he, how does he know that? What, what does he mean when he – if it's a tarot card, just help me understand. So he turns it over and he – turns ma- over the cards, and they, they start interpreting the cards. as they, Okay. They, and they gave him a date, and it said February 3rd, Buddy Holly dies. This was in 1957. And then when uh, January passed, and of course it was now February 1958 – uh, I think the crickets played in England in March of that year. So Joe Meek goes over to Buddy Holly and says, oh, I was so worried because I was playing tarot cards. And it said, on February 3rd, you would die. And, of course, Buddy Holly looks at him very suspiciously. And he says, he says, all right, I'll tell you, I'll promise I'll be careful on every February 3rd. When Holly came back to the United States, he had talked about this strange conversation he had with this guy who claimed he was going to die and that someone had thrown a brick through his dressing room window with a piece of paper tied to it for him to autograph it. But on February 3, 1959, that was the exact date of the plane crash. And when that happened, you know, Meek was obsessed. He was like, oh, my gosh, this is true. So he got more and more into the occult. And uh, maybe more so that he did the song called The Tribute to Buddy Holly uh, with Mike Berry. was the singer. He sounded a lot like Holly. So he had a seance to contact the spirit of Buddy Holly. And the spirit told him that see you in the charts because it seemed like Joe Meek was very polite and he wanted to get Buddy Holly's comment on his new song. And of course now the listeners may remember the song Telstar. Yeah, that, that was, was the, by song. the Tornadoes or Yeah, by the Oh, you're good. Yeah. Uh it was written by Joe Meek and Joe Meek was completely tone deaf, so nobody knows how he could ever compose it, but he did. <laughs> And it was, I think, the second British song, or was the first British song by a rock group to ever be number one in the United States, because that was almost impossible. So, you know, Meek would have seances with Buddy Holly. Uh, when Eddie Cochran died, he re- recorded a song called Just Like Eddie. It was an, another song, because he was obsessed with that. And then he started hanging out at Highgate Cemetery, 
with a tape recorder trying to tape uh, he supposedly he taped a cat that was talking and i mean he was really into it and then he he was became so obsessed with it that Richie Blackmore's wife Margaret said that she was convinced that he was possessed and she felt he was in, was possessed with this with the spirit of Crowley because that's what he was into but he kept thinking that people were bugging his apartment he would shave his head and his eyebrows he uh Eventually, it, it ended in terrible tragedy because Meek had been arrested on a soliciting charge, and uh, there was a body found. It was called the suitcase murders, and this young boy had been butchered, and, and his body was put in two suitcases. Is this in England or this in America? This is in England. This is in England, okay. and, and Joe Meek had known him. And he knew the kid in the, he in knew the suitcase. The kid. Yeah, he had met the kid, and he was afraid the police were going to investigate him. He was kind of upset with that. And his landlady had always complained about his his music, and and uh, he may have been thrown out of his uh, his apartment. So she came up to see him, and Joe Meek shoots her with a shotgun, kills her, and then he turns the shotgun on himself and commits suicide. And he committed suicide on February third, nineteen sixty seven, on the anniversary of Buddy Holly's death. So mm. let's just say that Joe Meek was a member of the Buddy Holly curse. Yeah, and and. I mean, I know very little about Joe Meek other than he was, uh, as you mentioned, he was this extraordinary British record producer. He produced all sorts of top 10 British hits for all these different bands, and he was well sought after. I thought, actually, that they didn't know for sure if he killed his landlady or not. Um, no, actually, actually, is it, is there it was a, a witness to it. it was, okay. uh, I think his name was Patrick Pink. He was one of the guys who worked for Meek, and he said hmm. he saw her body fall down the steps, and the, the back of her, uh, or her back was smoking from the shotgun pellet. Oh. And then as he rushed up the steps, he heard the shotgun go off again, and Joe Meek had shot himself under the under the under chin the with a shotgun, and it was, you know, extremely terrible. So, uh, you know, that was a case, and I mean, it's pretty bad. But if we go on with the curse and we take a look at Joe Meek, I mean, after Buddy Holly was killed, the crickets still went on because probably the luckiest two guys on that tour was uh, Waylon Jennings and Tommy Alsop, who uh, Buddy Holly had hired and had actually rented the plane for all three of them. And, of course, Tommy also wins the coin toss with Richie Valens. Well, he actually loses. In some ways, he won great more than he lost. And the story goes that when also went back to Texas, he started a saloon called the Heads Up Saloon because it saved his life. But they took a singer whose name was Ronnie Smith, and he took Buddy's place on the tour. After the show, Ronnie Smith checked himself into a rehab and hanged himself. I mean, odd. Then the crickets went out, and they found a new singer whose name was David Box. He was a young kid who sounded eerily close to Buddy Holly. Matter of fact, there's some sources that say he actually did the vocal on Peggy Sue Got Married. Get out. Oh, well, he was good. So let me tell you what happened. He he played with the Crickets for a while, and he left the band on, let's see, on, on October 23rd, 1964. He and his band rented a small plane to fly out of Houston. The plane crashes. He was killed, just like Buddy Holly. Both of them were 22 years old. All right, Holly and David Box. And then we have Bobby Fuller. Bobby Fuller lived in Texas. He sent a demo tape to Buddy Holly's parents, and Buddy Holly's parents heard it. They sent it to Norman Petty, who was Buddy's old record producer, right. and Bobby Fuller was signed by Norman uh, Petty, and they did a number of songs in Texas. And then in 1963, Bobby Fuller moves to uh, Hollywood, which is kind of interesting, I guess, Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Bobby Fuller of the Bobby, Bobby, Bobby Fuller 4? Four. Four. This is I, I Shot the Law? I mean, I uh, Fought the Law. I fought the yeah. law and I'm, all right. That's what's always funny, and because you know this stuff, this is great. It's like old friends talking. And, yeah. And so, he, so this is so he goes, so he moves to Hollywood. He moves to Hollywood, yes. And then he signs with Delphi Records. And when he signs with Delphi Records, he he does the song "I Fought the Law." Now, the the song was written by Sonny Curtis, who played in the Crickets. Right. So it's a cricket produced song. And then the last song that he recorded was "Love's Made a Fool of You," which was written by Buddy Holly. Now, on July 18, 1966, Bobby Fuller had moved his mother into his apartment. There was a phone call at 1 a.m., and uh, he tells his mother that he wants to borrow her car because he had a Corvette. So he borrows his mother's car. He takes off. She doesn't see him the rest of the night, doesn't see him in the morning, the afternoon. And later that night, she hears the car pull in, so she thinks, well, he's safe. But no one comes to the door. So after about 30, 40 minutes, she walks down to her car. She opens the door, and there's Bobby Fuller stretched out in the front seat. He had been badly beaten. He had been doused in gasoline, and there was gasoline in his stomach. So Bob Keene, the owner of Delphi Records, was called to the house. He came at the same time the police were there, and the police had told him that 
Bobby Fuller committed suicide. It was just a, you know, and but you can't commit suicide by drinking gasoline because if you drink gasoline, you automatically regurgitate it. So whatever happened to Bobby Fuller, we're not sure, but we do know that his parents had hired a detective to try to get the answers, and the detective was shot at as he went back to his apartment. He quit. Uh, one of the members of the Bobby Fuller Four had someone break into his room. He was threatened. He left, and Randy Fuller, the brother who played bass, was uh, driven off the road. So they all went back to Texas, and the rumor is that Bobby Fuller was dating a girl whose name was Melanie, and that she was also dating someone who had very close ties to organized crime. So if his death was from that result, I guess you would say that you know maybe love did make a fool of him at the end. But that's the story of uh, Bobby Fuller that's still not been solved. Uh, and just am I making a wrong connection when I say – Delphi Records, didn't that also connect to Richie Valens or Buddy Holly? Oh, my goodness. Yes, it did. It's and Bo- very good. Is, isn't it? Is There's it... someone else with Delphi. Do you know who it was? Well, wait, but Bob Keene, wasn't he the guy that discovers Richie Valens? He does. He does. Okay. So, again, that ties us back to the rich, to the, to the curse, to the February it 3rd does, curse. because it goes back to Bobby Fuller. It connects with Richie Valens. And there was one other artist with Delphi Records, and his name was Sam Cooke. Oh, how about that? And then another guy who has a mysterious, it, tragic it, death. Exactly. And Bob King was actually investigated, I think maybe by the FBI, because they were kind of concerned that maybe he was killing these artists for insurance. Well, insurance and also because then he kind of takes control a lot of royalties, I would imagine. Oh, when, you, when the albums go out, I think Jimi Hendrix once said, it's funny how people love the dead. Once you're dead, you're made for life. <laughs> uh, very interesting. I didn't know that about him being investigated by the FBI. I wonder if that's true. But uh, That's what he told us on uh, the VH1 Confidential show that we really? did. Yeah, he was he was interviewed on there. Fear the Reaper, though, yet some people have, and they, they've had premonitions. Just for Snicks, do you want to go over some of the rock artists who have had premonitions of their own death? Because we could start with Buddy Holly, can't we? Oh, yeah, well, you know, not only did Buddy Holly have a premonition of his death, but his wife Maria had a premonition. And the story goes that before he left for the tour, uh, Maria had this dream, and the dream was that she was in a field, and all these people were running by her. And she didn't understand why they were running, but it was like in a, in a farmland. And she looked up and she saw this huge fireball, and, as, and she realized what they were running from. She started to run, and then the fireball smashed into the ground. And when it smashed into the ground, she, she was awakened, and she saw Buddy was next to her, and he was crying. And she said, well, said, what's wrong? She said, oh, I just had this terrible dream. He said, I dreamed that me and my brother were flying this small plane. We were in New York, and that my brother told me to drop you off at the top of one of the skyscrapers, so he let you off, and then I left you, and I could see you standing there waiting for me, but he said, no, it's okay, we'll come back, and he said, I just had this really sense that I had just flown off and left you, Ugh. and this was right before he left to go on the Winter Dance Party Tour, so I guess you would say that would be two premonitions on the same night by both people. Well, then we can add in a third, Richie Valens, and he was always afraid of flying, and and unless the movie mistells or exaggerates the story, and I thought it was true, that he had had it always a, a premonition that there would be a crash that he would be a part of. Well, actually, it was uh, more than a premonition. There used to be, when he was in school, he would go out at lunch and sit under this tree and play his guitar, and all the kids would gather around and listen to him. Well, one day he went to his uncle's funeral, and while he was gone, his friends gathered around the tree, and a plane blew up over the schoolyard, and the debris fell, and, and Richie Valens' friend was killed. And this was in the schoolyard. So this is what really terrified him of flying. And the story goes that Richie's mother also had a premonition, but she didn't want to tell him because she was afraid that it would uh, interfere with his career. And I remember that he was telling someone, they went to a church to pray before he left for the Winter Dance Party Tour, and she said, well, I thought you had a terrible fear of flying. What will happen if you crash? And he said, well, I'll land on my guitar. That's what he told her. Mm. And, you know, it was very odd that Richie Valens wanted to take the last seat in the plane. You know, that's why he had the coin toss with Tommy Alsop, because, you know, he had such a terrible fear of flying. And, and if you're going to have a fear of flying, flying at night in a yeah. small plane into a snowstorm. Right. With a pilot who wasn't tested on his uh, instru- you know, his instruments, I mean, that would have been the time to have ridden on the bus. <laughs> I think so. Uh, and But yet, did John Lennon also have a premonition of his death? Uh, John had was convinced that he would die a violent death. And uh, Frederick Siemens, who was uh, 
with John had always mentioned that John had this premonition that he would be shot because shooting, he, he considered, was a modern form of crucifixion. And he was saying that he had had some violence in his life, the way he had treated people, and that he felt that this would give him a clean karmatic uh, slate. But he was convinced that he was doomed to die a violent death. And, of course, when he was shot at the Dakota, you know, it, it just it, it just follows into the pattern. But, sure. yeah, there was a premonition there. And, see, another thing was that when the Beatles played, you know, John was so into the number nine, we've, we've talked about this again, but he received a note saying that he would be shot on stage, like at 9 o'clock. And when the, when the Beatles went on, this was, I think, on their second tour, and it may have been in Memphis. So the Beatles were playing, and John Lennon, you know, he was very nearsighted, and he was on stage just wondering. And I think that was the night someone threw some firecrackers. And, I mean, he was terrified with that. So the gunshot would even go back to then. And then the song you played on the radio, uh, Come Together, the very first thing that John Lennon says in the song is, shoot me, that shoot me at the first and as he did his last interview at the Dakota on the Playboy interviews, he was mentioning there was a gunshot, and he stops and he says, oh, another murder at the Rue Dakota. In the entire history of the Dakota, there was only one murder, and that was John Lennon. Oh, be darn. Uh, who else had premonitions? Other lesser-known premonitions? Well, let's see. If I, as I think about it, I mean, there's been some people who've had some really bad luck. You know, I know Cliff Burton and Metallica played a, a card game, and for the last bunk on the bus and drew an ace of spades, which is a card associated with death. And I guess he didn't think about that. He drew it, got the bunk and the, the bus turned over and he was killed. Oh. Uh, you know, Bob, uh, we talked about Johnny Horton. I right. Think there's a lot of people who've had, you know, like just strange feelings, uh, maybe other people for them, but you know, just off the top of my head, those are the most. Oh, those are good numbers. enough. And we were talking about Eddie Cochran then. So just to wrap it up before, we go to the break and we start taking calls for Gary Patterson. That that Eddie Cochran story, that, that really does stick out. Yeah, it does. I mean, it's kind of like Final Destination, the movie series, you know, because uh, Eddie Cochran was supposed to be on the Winter Dance Party Tour with Buddy Holly, and they were best friends. And one of the legends is that, that Cochran had skipped the show so he could do the Ed Sullivan show or do some appearance. But when he heard of the plane crash, he was devastated, and he was convinced that he had cheated death and that it was out to get him. So when he went to England, and where he was extremely famous, when he got to England, George Harrison followed him every show he did so he could stand in the front and see how Eddie did his fingering of the guitar. Because, I mean, Cochran was different from Buddy Holly. I mean, Eddie Cochran played the guitar. He did, he riffed on the guitar. Right. And so his girlfriend, Sharon Sheely, came over. And, of course, Sharon's interesting because she had written a song for – Richie Valens called Hurry Up. She had also written a song for uh, Ricky Nelson, Poor Little Fool. So she was, according to her, she was engaged to, to Eddie. And when she got to England, she noticed that Eddie was sitting in his hotel room with all the lights turned off, and he had her go out and buy all the Buddy Holly singles she could bring back. And he was sitting in this darkened room and listened to the singles. And she would say, Eddie, you got to get over this. And he'd look at her and he'd say, no, because I know I'll be seeing Buddy soon. And then he goes to see a psychic in England. And because he was convinced he was going to die. Later in the tour, he wakes up and he screams, oh, my God, I'm going to die, and there's not anything anyone can do about it. Well, after he finished the tour on Easter Sunday on April 17, 1960, he, Sharon Sheely, and Gene Vincent were in a car going to the, to the airport when a tire blew out. The car crashed, and Eddie Cochran was thrown from the car and killed. And as he was taken to the hospital in Bath, Sonny Curtis and Jerry Allison, who just happened to be in England, they were two members of the Crickets, and they were backing up the Everly Brothers. They rushed to the hospital to see Eddie Cochran. So the last people who saw Cochran were two members of the Crickets. The last song that, that uh, Eddie Cochran did, he did two songs. On February 5th, 1959, just two days after the plane crash, he recorded a song called Three Stars, which is a tribute to Betty and the Big Bopper and Richie Valens. His, his voice is so filled with emotion that he tells the producer, he said, if you ever release the song, I'll never record another one. The song wasn't released until after his death. But the last song he recorded was called Three Steps to Heaven, and the backup band on that was the Crickets, mm. and that was the last song he recorded. I can't think of a better way to wrap up a discussion about rock and roll premonitions, and, and thank you, too, for just going with us wherever this conversation takes us. <laughs> no I, problem. I know, I know we're keeping you on your feet, but that's just the way it's got to be, and we'll come back, and who knows where we'll go. Gene, you're talking with Gary Patterson. Go ahead. 
Yeah, Gary, my question uh, involves uh, why Buddy Holly uh, was on that winter tour in 1959. Uh, his wife, uh, his widow, Marina, says that she blames Norm Petty, his manager, mm -hmm. because he was keeping most of the money that Buddy Holly and the Crickets were making in those, uh, in those early years. And uh, uh, he would, but Norm Petty would just give uh, Buddy Holly and the Crickets uh, an allowance. And uh, his wife was pregnant, uh, Billy Holly, Buddy Holly's wife was pregnant, and, they, and he needed the extra money. He wasn't going to send Norm Petty any more money. He had told him that, and so he was on that winter tour just to, to make extra money for for himself and his friends and, uh, of course, his, his wife and, and baby uh, that she was carrying, uh, whom, uh, and of course, when she heard about his death, she had a miscarriage, unfortunately. My question, though, is how prevalent is was this uh, back then? Uh, uh, that keeping uh, the money, that, you mean? Huh? Keeping the money, you mean? Yeah, managers uh, keeping most of the money that uh, these entertainers would be making. These young entertainers, uh, because Buddy Holly was not really, you know, yeah. into finances and business. And I just wonder how many of these, how many singers were like him and had manager problems of this nature. Was Probably the trouble? same. The same percentage that have them today, too. But go <laughs> yeah. ahead, Gary. Oh, I mean, you did a great job explaining why Buddy Holly was on the tour. It was because his wife was pregnant, and uh, he was forced to have to provide, and that was it. And he would never have gotten on those school buses in that Arctic winter to go out and do that. Right. And the story you're saying, though, is a very – I mean, this story, it's one of the oldest stories in rock and roll. I mean, it was tragic that a lot of artists uh, – signed contracts in which they received almost nothing. And probably the greatest tragic band in the history of rock and roll, in my opinion, on the subject is Badfinger. And, uh, you know, Badfinger had a number of his songs, but sure. two of the members committed suicide because right. they couldn't withdraw, they couldn't get their royalty checks. Pete Ham uh, hanged himself. Uh, and, of course, he was 27, which Ian knows about. But, you know, he had left a note talking about how the manager was soulless for not letting him have his money. And then uh, Tom Evans, uh, the, the bass player, uh, hung himself as well a few years later. So, I mean, they were destitute. They came to the United States to do a tour, and there were no there were no shows, and they lived in this, this house in the Midwest in the winter, and there was nothing booked, no money. And yet they had songs like Without You and uh, Baby Blue, and, and uh, the money was never accounted for properly. So it, it's a tragic story in rock and roll. Yeah, you know, and thank you so much for bringing that up. It, it actually speaks so much to me to this whole Napster thing because – when the idea of Napster originally came up and people were file sharing songs, mm -hmm. it was the record companies that were crying poverty. And they were saying this is taking money out of their you know, hands, which they're going to turn around and give to the artists who are just stealing from the artists. Now, no doubt, you know, there are artists who weren't going to get royalties from, you know, Napster related Internet activities. But they, the, the record labels are like the last people in the world who can be trusted with anybody's money and anybody's accounting on the subject of money. They've been ripping off people for so many decades. If they suddenly got religion on paying proper royalties to the artists, then that's the greatest thing Napster could ever have done. I agree with you 100 percent. I don't know, it sounds like a like a Columbo episode or something, but are there any cases of managers killing their own artists? Well, uh, basically what you have, you have a, a great deal of suspicion. I know when you talk about managers, the first name that comes to mind was Mike Jeffrey with uh, Jimi Hendrix. And the story goes, if you remember, that uh, when Hendrix had signed with Jeffrey, strange things started happening. Hendrix became more and more depressed. Uh, the story goes that when he was caught going across into Canada, that heroin had been placed in his uh, in his luggage that didn't belong to Hendrix because he never used heroin, and that he was convinced that Jeffrey was doing this, showing him that he couldn't survive without him, that he could reach out and get him at any time. Uh, a week before Hendrix died, maybe two weeks, Hendrix had been kidnapped, and he was put in the trunk of a car, left in a garage. He was tied to a chair, and Jeffrey's uh, agents came and, and picked him up. And uh, the strange case of Hendrix's death, uh, Eric Burden claims, well, he's one of the, the people behind this, but he said that uh, Hendrix had call, uh, called Chaz Chandler, his old manager, and said, man, I need help bad. 
And then his death was so mysterious. And like I said, people had, had taken into his uh, apartments and stolen a number of things that Hendrix belong, uh, had that belonged with him. And Devon Wilson, Hendrix's girlfriend, just happened to fall off of a skyscraper in New York. And uh, Jeffrey, when, as they were questioning him, I believe he was leaving from Spain in a passenger plane, and the plane blew up. And Jeffrey was killed in the plane crash. So when I think about that, you know, as far as, is making money from a dead artist. I think that the Jimi Hendrix story, the legend That's behind really that, is the most intriguing. It is. Uh, I, I mean, I can't think of it. I mean, because I, I, the caller brought up uh, Patsy Cline earlier. And I I mean, it just doesn't make any sense to kill a golden goose. No. Except, you know, if you figure that they've reached a certain point where their music would go on forever, that they wouldn't need to be around anymore, and you can make more money off greatest hits albums and that sort of thing and not have to worry about you know, paying royalties or having contracts challenged. You know, I think Johnny Ace was the first to to show that a dead artist could sell records. You Didn't know, he shoot the, himself backstage? Yeah, and it was it was a strange case of uh, he had taken a gun and he was carrying it around. I think it was in Houston on Christmas Eve, something like that. And Big Mama Thornton was at the show, and he was pointing a gun at people, pulling the trigger. And she took the gun away from him. He he asked it back. She gave it back to him, and she said, "Don't point the gun." So he takes the gun, he points it at his girlfriend's head, pulls the trigger, nothing happens. He takes the gun, points it at his girlfriend's friend who is with her, pulls the trigger, nothing happens. And he looks at her and says, I, I told you it wasn't loaded. And he takes the gun, puts it into his to his head, pulls the trigger, the gun goes off, and Johnny Ace books his ticket to rock and roll heaven right there. And so I guess you would say that his record company came out with uh, the late, great Johnny Ace, where you had a signed 8 by 10 and his record. So they made a great deal of money off uh, Johnny Ace's tragic death. But, you know, it does show that, that you can make money from an artist. And, it, yeah. and sadly, in our culture, you know, you look at someone who dies and look how fast their greatest hits album come out so that you can buy them and, you know, just pictures sure. and everything else. It kind of reminds me of the whole Kurt Cobain thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there hasn't been any more developments on that. I mean, the whole idea of any murder associated with Kurt Cobain. That's 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 a rock and roll legend that's rolled over by now, hasn't it? Well, I don't know. Uh, I did a show with Ian Halpern, and Ian had written a book, Who Killed Kurt Cobain and Love and Death. And on this show, as we were talking, he was saying, you know, he was he's convinced there's going to be an arrest and it's, the case is going to be reopened. So we'll just have to wait and see. I'll be darned. When did he say that? How long ago? About six months ago. I'll be darned. Well, I mean, it... Uh, it I, there's a lot of people out there convinced that it's true. I've seen just kind of the anecdotal evidence. Let's see what the police think of as as being worth investigating and what the prosecutors will take the court with. Pat for Gary Patterson. Pat? Yeah, how you doing? Um, hello? Yes, we're right hello, here. Okay. Um, I'm calling about Jimi Hendrix's death. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, it seems to me that that uh, Eric Clapton had something to do with that. And the evidence that I have to that is that when when uh, Eric Clapton first heard Hendrix play, he was with Chas Chandler standing there listening to Hendrix, and and uh, Hendrix uh, or Clapton asked uh, Chandler if if Hendrix was was really that good or had he. Um, uh, or, or was he just good at that song? And Chandler says, "No, he's that good, Eric." And if you if you remember, Eric was riding high as pretty much the king of uh, of blues rock guitar until Hendrix uh, 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 did his first album or did his first hit. And uh, so that just, I mean, he just blew everybody out of the water with what he could do and his his uh, mind for music. And um, so then. Now he's in he's in London. You know, of course, Hendrix was a heavy drug user, um, apparently, and he's in London, and uh, which is uh, uh, Clapton's stomping grounds, right? And uh, everybody knows everybody and what everybody's doing when it comes to the music world. I'm a musician myself, and I know how that goes. And there's a lot of jealousies and a lot of uh, ego trips, and uh, and uh, you know, Eric Clapton was not that good. I mean, he was good in, with Cream. But everything he's done since then is pretty much copycat Muddy Waters, uh, a few lame uh, uh, hits of his own, like My Father's Eyes. Nothing that really drives drives you, you know, or reaches into you uh, as far as uh, some, you know, good guitar work. And uh, 
So anyway, so the next thing you know, Hendrix is dead, and, uh, uh, and and it's a big mystery. And I'm wondering if Eric Clapton and his boys, or just you know, had something to do with setting that up so that he would OD, and then that, okay. in that effect, get rid of him, and then Eric gets to be the king again, which never happened. But uh, well, so I don't I, know. You 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 you're pretty harsh there on Eric Clapton. <laughs> I got to be honest with you. I I, I was kind of waiting to see where you would go with that because I didn't want to jump in too early, but. I just couldn't I just couldn't disagree more. I think he's done some really interesting work and always has. Yeah, I'll go with you that there's some there's some cookie cutter cuts that he's put out since then, but I I wouldn't say he hasn't reached into my soul. A few songs have reached into my soul like uh Tears in Heaven. Well, you you got to consider you're 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 a white guy and and Clapton copied black American artists. Okay. Well, it, that was his. That was his goal was to be as good as as Black American artist. But he didn't really feel it in his soul. He did some real good stuff early on, but then everything I've ever heard him do after that was pretty much, you know, left that left that. Uh, um, well, I understand that. Blues uh, genre. And we, we just might have to disagree with that. No, I mean, we can disagree. That's fine. Because I, I, I think I, I think. I get that a lot anyway. I'm, I, I understand that. I think the Derek and the Domino stuff, and not yeah, exactly. to not just to mention Cream. I mean, I think there's, I mean, there's a there's a couple of. I mean, Four Sixty One Ocean Boulevard is a great album, period. And I think he finds a couple of cool grooves uh, between 1970 and and now. But all right, well, uh, that's just well, Hank, unless Gary, you wanted to go along with the Eric Clapton killed Jimi Hendrix theory. Well, I mean, I think that. I've seen some things like a, a personal video that Jimi Hendrix and Eric Clapton met each other or they saw each other at the theater. They were watching Sly and the Family Stone, which is kind of all we just talked about it. And and uh, Clapton had purchased a left-handed Stratocaster for Jimi Hendrix. He was going to give it to him that night, but Hendrix didn't show up. They were going to do a jam with uh, Sly Stone. And when Clapton had heard that Hendrix had died. This was one of the main reasons he gets even more despondent in his heroin addiction. And in this video, he was talking about that left-handed guitar, and he looks into the camera, and these tears run out of Clapton's eyes, and he said, and he left me here. He left me here with this left-handed guitar, the Stratocaster. And then he had to stop the filming. And you know, I mean, it's so personal. I mean, there was a great admiration for Eric Clapton, but I think Clapton doesn't like to get close to people. I know that. And the other thing is, too, that, you know, Clapton sometimes needs another guitarist who can push him. And when you talked about Derek and the Dominoes, when Dwayne Allman and Eric Clapton played, I mean, that was magic. So, you know, I think that's it. And I think he he likes to evolve, and I, I don't see anything wrong with that. 